Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm with my friend Stephen Slay. How are you, mate? I am always excellent. Good. We both, what are we, like half a mile away from each other? Probably, if that. If that. Basically, yeah. I just rolled down this very wet, windy day. Can you yeah, believe it? Because we struggle here in Los Angeles with our three rainy days a year. So Isn't it crazy? It's yeah. like pouring with rain. But I think the problem is because it's always so beautiful. Right. The three days it rains, everyone's like, oh my God, this is just like the worst, <laughs> worst thing in the world. Whereas like, you know, I lived in Boston where, you know, right. eight months out of, the, out of the year, it's rainy, wet and freezing and snowy. It's like, okay, it's just another day in Boston. We're here. It's like, we get that one rainy day and it's like hell is freezing over. Cars are crashing into the sides of the, the I can't canyon. figure that it's, out because we're, we're all yeah. from wet. Almost everybody that comes to LA is from a wet, rainy climate. Right. But you and get used to it drive. here quick. You get used to it really fast. We're spoiled. You know? Yeah. I've been here now 10 years and, and having lived in cold climates my entire right. life. And, so you're from Boston know. originally? Uh, New Jersey originally, then Boston, then here. So I went from, you know, uh, northeast to northeasterner to beautiful, sunny California. What did you do in Boston? Were you going to school there? I was going to school there. I was recording records there. I was nice. making, causing trouble there, you know. Uh, having fun. It's a great music town. When I, I when I was out there working, I, I was there for like four months working, and every other person's in music. Well, it was Pretty awesome. I mean, when I was there, there was two major scenes going on. There was a metal scene, which was interesting for me because when I got there, I was like a huge Beatles fan. I wanted to start a band, yeah. and I realized I had to start writing like hard rock songs and metal songs in order to form a band. So, you know, it was it was. And then I kind of got into that kind of music, actually. Right. And then there was a big hip hop scene too. Now yeah. I guess there's a big there's a big indie scene after I left, and all kinds of different stuff happening. Yeah, I noticed but, a lot of indie bands that yeah. I work with are from Boston. Yeah, the Boston area. Yeah, it's interesting though because what are the studios there? That completely off subject because I remember working. I worked at Q Division like maybe three. Q or four Division times. was the big one when yeah. I was there. It was a one called uh, Blue Jay. Um, um, Man, I mean, yeah, I mean, Q, Q Division was really one of the big ones. I worked at a studio, I think it was called Renaissance Recording Company. I mean, there was a bunch of studios there. Clearly, 10 years later, oh, of course, there was New Alliance. No, uh, no. There was Woolly Mammoth. Woolly Mammoth, um, I've heard of. Yeah. Um, and then there was good old Bang Recording, which is my little underground studio in Roxbury. What, and what kind of stuff did you have in your studio? The first really cool piece of gear that I got was an old uh, AMR console, you know, that PV ended up buying. I think I had the old AMR 1600. And what was cool about that desk is it really got me into the electronic side of things. I had to recap the whole thing myself. Wow. I redid all the quad amplifiers and the EQs. I redid the whole master section with, you know, a bunch of, I upgraded all the chips to Burr Brown stuff and, you know, learned very quick about, you know, oscillation and, sure. and figuring and out fire. that you can't just, you can't just take, oh, hey, this chip has, you know, this right. is a four, four pin, this is a four quad, I can just swap it out, everything will be fine. And next thing you know, something's blowing up and, you know, it was, it was a really cool experience, you know, recapping and upgrading a console and it really, get, you know, it, 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 it played to my passions. It's funny you talk about PV. I, I honestly think PV is like a rite of passage. I still, yeah. I still will stand by this. PV is like, they're yeah. a great American company. Like they pretty much make affordable quality stuff. Sure. Let's be honest. I mean, like we were talking well, earlier about- Every once in a while they have this uh, one piece that's just awesome. Yeah. I think I have a guitar amp in, in, in there. It's something like a, a valve something or other. It sounded awesome. I don't yeah. know. I, I, need, I needed a small amp that wasn't going to be like my dual rectifier that, that was going to be easier for smaller gigs sure. that had some nice tubish tone. And I remember it was a PV. I haven't used it, of course, in 10 years, but it's somewhere back there. Well, you know, Barisi is like a huge PV. Is that right? He has tons of PV amps. I think, yeah, I agree. The, tu the PV tube stuff, mm -hmm. it's built like a freaking brick shit yeah. house. As of we course, but before we started taping, we were talking about, of course, their, their flagship early product, which was the 5150. Oh yeah, which is amazing. You know, which is now, I guess, what the sixty-five something or other. Oh, they changed the name. <laughs> yeah, they changed it, but you know. Yeah, that really, was that's an amazing sounding amp. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, and I still uh, the, there's a little VST sixty-five. I still have a real soft spot for that amp. Sure. I had it for like maybe five or six years touring, mm -hmm. and it never broke down. I'll tell you another secret PV piece that I thought was really cool. On some of my drum samples, I used it. It was called I think it's called the Cosmos. Mm, it was like this rack mount uh, bass enhancer. It might, I, I'm sorry if I have the wrong name for it, but it was a rack mount um, bass enhancer and it sounded really good. Right. It was Perfect. really cool. I don't know what the hell I used it on, but I used it on something. I'm, I'm all about like kind of unpretentious, does the job kind of products. Oh, you know sure. I mean? You know, the thing about your stuff and 
is that the affordability and the bang for the buck is just through the roof. Right. Well, I think a lot of that is is based on the fact that I still make products for that young engineer Great. living in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Great. Broke, living from paycheck to paycheck, recording any band that'll say hi to me. You know, half the yeah. time I remember at one point I was gigging and I was like, choosing gigs based on, oh, that band would be cool to work with. So if we gig with them, I can, you know, sure. befriend them and, 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 and convince them to come to the studio so I can record them. You know, I mean, that was really, that was part of my marketing plan back then. But anyway, the, yeah, a lot of the products I make, I think, can that kid who's, you know, 21 years old and, and has, you know, just, you know, spent his life savings on, on, on recapping an old crappy console, can he afford this stuff? And if the answer is no, it, I don't like that, you know? I, I, I want to figure out, well, how can I make it so that he can afford it and I can still keep the lights on and feed my guys here, you know? Yeah, and you know what? There's there's no shame in that because we just talking, I was talking earlier about Henry Ford. Look, mm -hmm. at, look at Ford. Henry Ford was an innovator. He made affordable cars. He got everybody in a car. If it yeah. hadn't been for him, it would have been just the elite. But not only that, he also made the Ford GT, or the company made the Ford GT40, mm -hmm. what, six, seven years ago, recreation mm -hmm. right. of the G, uh, sorry, the Ford GT, a recreation of the GT40. Yeah. It retailed at about a hundred grand, which is a lot of money. However, it had a Ford F350 truck engine. Mm -hmm. They have redesigned. It was beating Lamborghinis and Ferraris, and it was one third the price. Wow. So as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that's that's the world I love, you know. Yeah. So I mean, your products are like that. You know, you you give amazing value for money, and you sound as good as the more expensive guys. Just be honest. I mean, and that's, I appreciate that. I mean, that's 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 the goal. So yeah. I mean, what you're stating is exactly what we strive for here. We want to make the best quality stuff. We don't cut any corners, and it's not fun if we make the best quality stuff and no one can use it. No yeah. one can have it. I mean, I, I hate that. Uh, some companies, you know, come out with stuff and it's just so expensive and i'm like well that's cool but imagine if you had really that same quality but you you could afford it and that's why i'm really happy about uh, a lot of our our new price plans and you know the, the new everything bundle of course is great for guys who great idea. on a budget uh, and and of course the <coughs> microphone which we'll be talking about and that's why i wanted to come down and talk to you about yeah because you're gonna be launching this at nam is that correct uh so technically it's launched we're, we're just waiting for uh, all the things to ship into our warehouse then we're going to turn it around to our dealers so it's it's done, um, perfect. You know, uh, and we're 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 ready to go. And but yeah, by the time Nam Show uh, is, uh, it'll be hopefully in people's hands by then. So it'll be right around Wonderful. the time we'll be shipping. So let me get the name correct. Is the Virtual Microphone Collection? Virtual Microphone System. System. Which includes the Virtual Preamp Collection and Virtual Microphone Collection modules. So you're kind of right. But the whole okay. system all together, which is the mic, the preamp, and the f software, is the Virtual Microphone System. And what's the retail on that? The retail, uh, look, let's say this, the street price, uh, US is nine ninety nine. That's pretty fantastic. Yeah. And for that, you are going to get simulations of what incredible You works. get a simulation of the classic 47. Yep. Uh, you get a simulation of the classic 251, the more modernized uh, 800, uh, you know, the microphone that's used in a lot of pop and, and hip hop records. And uh, you get two preamps, the classic 73 British preamp and the old school um, Telefunken 76 preamp. Wonderful. Now, basically, the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because you're the correlation between so many people. When I go and interview people, I would say 99% of them have your plugins. And we just uh, interviewed Ken Sluter, who's going to probably already been aired by now. Mm -hmm. And he's one of those guys that's in the trenches I really respect. Yeah. Like a guy who's working 15 hours yeah, a day, sure, been, been involved in about 50 records. And he just talked about three guys, and you're one of them. Between him and Linda and everybody else I've been talking to, like real people that are making records, they always come to your products. So when you told me about this a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to talk to you about it because I use a 47. I use a 47 every mm -hmm. day. And one of the things that I think that we need to talk about yeah. to people is there's no such thing as a gen, you know a generic 47 sound. No, definitely not. When I've been when I went to Sausalito to do that second fray record, they mm -hmm. had oh, I don't know if it was four or five or maybe six, but they had like four yeah. or five 47s. And they were mm -hmm. like, this one's the Stevie Wonder one, this right. one's the you know, every every mic had a story. Yeah. So we flew up the mics, plural, and went through them. And I have never heard a more diverse sounding of bunch of 47s in my life. Right. So for kids and people up and coming, they see mm. these $15,000 price tags. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, and you know this, mm -hmm. that there was one mic that we liked the sound of. Of course. 
And to be honest, the the recreation when we went back mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to Denver to finish up vocals was actually better sounding than any of the originals. And, yeah. and I know that's going to start a whole massive debate, and I actually don't mind that. We should all talk about this. Mm -hmm. But what I love that what you've done is you went out and you found the best sounding mics to simulate. Sure. So what this gives to clients is the ability to have the best sounding mic, not just right. a generic, this sounds terrible, not just to waste a lot of money on something, yeah. you know. You went out there and you auditioned and found these mics. So give yeah. us a little bit of information about well, that. First. Well, first, you're absolutely right that uh, you, you look at one of these vintage mics and they're very old. Yeah. And these mics age. I have one, so I know. Differently. These age, mics age differently. And yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we listen to a lot of different mic models and none, none of them sound the same. In fact, some of them were quite different. But what we found is the ones that were in the best condition all were like brothers in the same family. So if you ever see a family, let's say, you know, and, you know I have a, a, a friend and he's got three brothers and they all look similar, but they're yeah. all a little different. So you know sure. they're in the same family, but there's unique things about each one. They're not, they don't look like twins, they're not identical, but they look like they're brothers. And that's what, to me, a good, you know, 47s, for instance, will sound like. They all have that characteristic 47-ish vibe. So they have that mid-range. They have that more rounded top end. They have that more, you know, rich lows and low mids. But if you compare them one to one next to each other, they're not going to sound exactly the same. And of course, that's because the way the tube ages, the way the capsule ages, is is parts, you know, it could be refurbished. I mean, you know, uh, the originals use an M7 my Mylar capsule. Those things did not age well, and they're very hard. Polyurethane, you know. basically, yeah. Yeah, they're, they, they didn't age uh, very well at all. VF14 tubes are different than, you know, there's the... Uh, the uh, a new new Vister tube in some of them, sure. which is a completely different sound, but still has that, again, still that brotherly type of thing. You know they're in the same family. Now, what we did, like you said, is we went around and we wanted to find the best of each mic. So we did listen to a lot of mics, and luckily we found one obsessive human who had <laughs> all of the best mics in one collection because he did a lot of the hard work for us. I mean, That's you great. Know, and, and, and what he did is he you know spent years building up his mic collection and actually got matched well, as much as, much as possible, pairs of the mics. And, uh, and those are the mics that we, we modeled, and they're unbelievable sounding. I mean, they right. really are unbelievable sounding mics. So these are not just, you know, we, I, I didn't want to sell this based on, ooh, it's a 47. I wanted to be, like, ooh, this is a lot of different microphones that sound great, so that when you put an artist or a source onto this thing, you'll find one mic that just sounds great and you won't be paying you know, a ton of money to do so. You know, that was the key. The key for, for the virtual microphone system isn't necessarily to brag about how you have emulations of classic microphones. It's to brag that you have multiple microphones in one product that you can find that will fit the source best and make the best music for you. Wonderful. You know, because here's a funny story for you. Again, back to that Boston studio. Um, I became obsessed with trying to buy a 47 when I was, when I was younger. Uh, I saved up, saved up, and, and kept on looking, looking, because I thought once I get a 47, I will be a real, you know, a sure. real engineer. It was like it was like there was a dividing line. It's a million I needed, story. I understand. You know, I need I needed that one microphone. Yep. And I finally got. Uh, I bought a 47. I think I spent six thousand dollars on it, uh, which to a 22 year old, that's basically equivalent to a million dollars. Okay. Yeah. You know, good. I mean, it was so expensive. I was like, oh my god. And the first band that I used this mic on was this singer. And we'd already done his, some of his vocals through a much cheaper mic, a $500 condenser mic, you know, really cheap solid state mic. And I put him on the 47, you know, thinking like this is the big, you know, divine, the, the divine moment when he's going he's gonna to listen Sky's to this. Gonna open up. Yeah, he's going to listen to his voice Light's through gonna... this. And then they were just going to like hold me up like the end of Rudy, and, you know, like slight, slight, slight. It was going to be like, yes, look what I've done for you. So he sings through the mic and he looks at me and he goes, no, I like the other one better. And I go, Wait, what now? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I like, I like the other one better. I go, no, no, you don't. No, 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 that's a 47. You like that one better. He goes, no, listen, that's, like the other one has a little more, you know, a little more highs and it's bringing me out a little more. I go, hang on, hang on, I'm EQ and I'm doing all kinds of things. And basically, I had to learn the hard lesson that despite the fact that this is a legendary microphone and, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and probably sounds good on many things. And over the years, I used it on, on a lot of people and it sounded great. Uh, one mic is not always going to sound horses for courses is the best on everything. There's not, and, and that's another reason why I want to make this. Because imagine I could say, okay, well, maybe that 47 didn't sound good, but let's try this 251. Sure. Boom, there it is. 
Maybe that didn't work. Let's try this C, you know, C12. Let's try this, um, you know, uh, M49. I mean, that's what this is going to give you the power to do. It's going to be sit there. You'll be able to sit there at your mix desk and try different microphones without ever touching, you know, microphone and swapping that's things cool. out and having to own thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And that, to me, is the ideal thing. Because you know what? Once you find that one, you know, chain that works the best on that source, magic happens. You know, once you align that vocalist with that microphone, that pre, that chain, and they sing through it and they go, oh yeah, hit record, I got it now. Mm -hmm. That's that's the magic of what we do. Yeah, I think I, 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 I relate to that so much. I, every time I interview guys like our peers and stuff, we always come to the same conclusion. We look around and we go, oh yeah, we've got like, you know, half a million dollars worth of stuff. And we all say the same thing. There's yeah. no way we could ever buy this again. Right. And that's the thing, we're in this sort of working class, upper middle class, you know, is what we're striving for kind of mm -hmm. industry these days. So for a guy to make good money in it, yeah, what they're going to do is take 75% of their income and buy a $100,000 console yeah. and $300,000 worth of mics and pre's and stuff like that. It's a different business now. Sure. You know, I'm talking to, you know, I'm not going to name drop all these guys, but all these guys that we go to, they're like, there's no way we could do this again. Right. There's not like this massive residual income from the music sure. business. This is a, this is a time... Where, which is good because it's mm -hmm. a leveling the playing field now. So there's a yeah. lot of guys out that can make a living doing music that never even could get into it now. Yeah. So what I like about what you're doing here is you're going to create a product for the everyman. Right. You know? Well, I mean, another big part of, of what I like to do here is, you know, um, I, I think music is an absolutely amazing thing. I think yeah. it's an a, a absolutely just stunning art that can can really transform Beethoven lives. Beethoven said gives voice and, to God. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's just this amazing art. And the problem with music uh, up until the last 10 years is it's, you know, the, cr the music creation and media creation part of it has been reserved to the elite. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. I don't like the elite clubs. Dude. You know, I, 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 you know, and, and it, that's we just did that on camera. Yeah, I, I grew I grew up with that thing. I, I hit those barriers all the time. Yeah, like, well, well, to me, I was. Know, how many I producers was, have copied my demos exactly the same, and right. then people have gone, "Oh, amazing production!" And I'm listening, going, "Oh, yeah." Well, yeah, for, for me, it was like I was always the punk kid trying to get in, yeah. into the big boys club. Whether I was an intern trying to get in some places, and yeah. whether I wanted to get that gear but couldn't because it was too expensive. Yeah. It's just this elite thing. It's like, hey, I just want to make music for people. I want to make music and and have people listen to their this, this thing that was once this song in their head yeah. and to hit play and hear it back in all its glory and to have the greatest feeling ever and then have their fans hear it and have sure. that, the greatest feeling ever and and up until you know the last 10 years to do that mm -hmm. would cost you so many thousands of dollars whether you're doing that at a commercial studio sure. or even if you had to buy the gear yourself so <coughs> I agree you know I think that the democratization of a lot of these tools is a fabulous thing because yeah. everyone should enjoy the art of creating music. It's a beautiful thing. I agree. Yeah, I mean, obviously $1,000 is $1,000, so it's not like, you know, it's free, but at the same time, <laughs> it's $45,000. Three marks is like 45, 50 grand. Actually, the 251 mark. goes now for 34,000 if you find a really good one. Yeah, really? The C12, you'll find it for about somewhere between 25 to 30. The 47 you can get for a bargain at around 14,000. Uh, a great Telefunken V76, I don't know, maybe five, 6,000. Yeah. 1073, vintage, good condition, 5,000. So, so I mean, got, I've got a bargain in my 47, I'm so glad. I <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I got mine for that, that 6K. Here's another funny story about that 47 microphone. Yep. Um, so that was one of the original demo microphones that we were testing out when we were doing our original modeling. Right. Now here's another interesting thing about when we model these microphones. When a tube or something goes wrong in a microphone, mm -hmm. I don't care if you if you fix it, there's a good chance it'll still never sound exactly the same as it used to. Right. So after we'd done some initial models on that original 47 microphone, the tube died. Oh. And we replaced that tube, but now we already kind of get modeled it and we might release this at a later time. It's not isn't to me it's not as as versatile as the 47 that we modeled. But uh, the tube died and replaced the tube. Whole new microphone, different mid range, different high end, slightly I different. I suppose the question range. everybody's going to want to ask is did you prefer it before or after? I mean, they were different. They were different. I, 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 don't, I mean, to, to prefer it on what? You yeah, know? No, I, I mean, on, on my own voice, I think maybe the original was better. Um, on, on, I tried to put it on the uh, uh, room mic for drums, and I thought it was a little better because it had a little more punch in the sure. upper mids and it was a little more dynamic. So, I mean, you know, on, uh, that's the question. Better on what? Uh, yeah. But what's interesting about modeling some of these older microphones is we can capture them in time. 
You know, for instance, the, the, if the 251 sure. we model <coughs> dies tomorrow, we'll still have a pretty darn accurate representation of what that thing sounded like. Yeah, you were playing me the 251 earlier. That, yeah. that simulation is insane. It's beautiful. It's I, a really gorgeous I, I sound. cannot see it any, I, you know. I'm no golden ears guy. I'm just like the rest of us working here. But I think I, you got I, pretty good ears. Man. Pretty good, but I couldn't. Right. I couldn't hear any. I couldn't hear any difference between those two. Yeah, that was a t that's that's a pretty good model. We that spent model a lot of time tweaking that one. Yeah, yeah, that one's pretty incredible. So, um, so let's talk about it. Let's let's have a look at what we've got going on here. Can sure. you can you talk? Uh, give us sort of an overview of the. So it starts off with the virtual microphone collection classic tubes module. Actually, I should say this. The first thing that happens really is that you go through the ML1 microphone because okay. in order to do this, in order to model a microphone, we need a reference, a linear reference to start off with. But the importance about the reference is it has to be higher bandwidth mm -hmm. than what you are modeling because you can't have less data and then model more data. It has to be the opposite sure. way. That was the thing that always didn't work with the... Um who did it? Was it Antara? Who did the, the virtual mic modeler? I'd rather not even say, but the point is... Yeah, that's you the can't, problem they you, always you, had. You, yeah. you can't really... I mean, yeah. to model a microphone, there's so much intricate details that sure. you have to recreate. And, and again, the most important part is that you need to have a, yeah. an initial Extended reference source. Bomb, yeah. um, exactly. So we have the ML1 microphone that goes to the VMS1 linear mic pre. Again, the mic pre, this is a flat and high bandwidth as you can possibly get. Great. Uh, Paul Wolf from uh, formerly of API and Tone Lux and now Fix Audio, um, he worked on this mic pre and, and said Paul's it's one of, the, one, of the, one of the flattest he's ever Great. measured. So then once we get this extremely flat linear signal, mm -hmm. now we can do some modeling with it. Um, and again, the modeling process starts by, you know, we put signals into both our microphone and the vintage microphones and that discrepancy and these dynamic discrepancies get modeled. So here is the, uh, the FG51 model, and um, that's the first you know piece that the the of the processing, and that's going to model all of the dynamic response from the microphone. It's the dynamic frequency response, the way it starts to saturate, the way that the harmonics relate to each other. I mean, every little bit and detail is modeled here. Um, Perfect. Next, we have the the one of the one of the two mic pre modules. This is the FG73. So this models all of the characteristics of what the mic preamp is doing. So when you put these two together, it simulates you know going through a 51 into a, uh, into a uh, classic British 73. What's interesting about this knob here, this is the virtual drive. What this is actually simulating is increasing the input gain while decreasing the output. So if you've ever done that in a mic pre where you want to get a little more beef, uh, this does it in one knob. So as you increase this virtual drive knob, you're getting more input gain and less output trim, and you can actually put it into overdrive. It's actually a cool overdrive effect if you really push it past 50. Oh, on most sources. When I was talking to Joe Barisi, we, we, we were talking about that's what we both do. We always click, click, click. As soon as you get audible distortion, just come back one and you know you're on the Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, that's definitely, on yeah. vocals especially, that's cool. And, yeah. and on drums, if you want to get a little more saturated of sound, uh, the FG73 does it really well. Fantastic. Um, uh, I have the FG401 compressor in here just because we'll, we'll be doing a little vocal in a second. But the cool thing about this whole system is if you use it with a fast Thunderbolt interface, the plugins add no additional latency. So right now That's we're at 96K, we're at 64 buffers, we're using a very fast Thunderbolt interface, and, and we're gonna get no audible latency. So you can track right through the entire plugin. That's fantastic. Right in, in, you can see we're in the DAW. We're not on a third party you know, application, we're tracking right into the DAW. Great, all right, well let's, let's, let's throw you under the, uh, under the bus, so to speak. Sure. I'm a pretty crappy singer, but I've just heard you sing and you're better. So let's sing like a five, ten second piece and then just mess around. And see what All right, we get. let's 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 try something. Now, obviously, this is not going to be a direct comparison. I just want to see what it's capable of doing. Sure, let's let's. We're going to have all of the. We're going to have all of audio. Uh, we'll be able to show you guys Stephen's various um, audio simulations that you'll be able to hear the comparatively between the mics. But this is just to see how it works here. Okay, here we go. And you scream like an animal It's incredible how you feel And it seems so impossible You're unstoppable, so, so real It's about as good as you're gonna get from me today Very nice, on a wet LA morning all right. <laughs> All right, well, let's play around with this and see what you can do with the mic simulations. 
Okay, so we'll start off with the 251 emulation right. into the FG73 discrete British mic pre emulation. And our virtual drive is around 9 o'clock. That's kind of where you'd probably set the input gain if you were actually recording this vocal. Right. Uh, and just for fun, we're going through the FG401 compressor on circuit 2, which is kind of like a mixture of a VCA attack, but with a kind of an optuous release. It's really pretty. So here we go. You scream like an animal It's incredible how you feel And it seems so impossible You're unstoppable, so surreal Okay, now let's go to a different mic And we'll go to the 47 now listen how just different the character of the vocal sounds just by changing the microphone. Here we go. You scream like an animal. It's incredible how you feel. Again, the, the mid-range is totally different. The top end is much That's rounder. The sound I know and like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got that, you know, that mid-range push. You know, for this type of part and for my voice, I mean, I don't think it's exactly the best fit. I think the 251 was better. But you know, this is just yeah. such a great thick mic for thin female vocals. It's amazing. Uh, when I'm in my lower registers and if I'm doing a song personally and I, I want some more of that thickness and that roundness, this is an amazing mic. But again, you know, two totally different characters uh, just by, you know, hitting a few buttons. Uh, right. Let's go to another mic. Here's the FG800. Now, this one's going to sound pretty interesting because, again, this is a super airy, sizzly kind of mic. It's great on pop vocals, uh, on, on spoken word kind of stuff like hip hop. It's great because it's so crisp and clear and it cuts. Probably might sound a little bit weird here, but anyway, let's let's take a listen. You scream like an animal. It's incredible how you feel. Very scoop and sizzly, you know. Yeah, it's got that really of, kind of kind of light in some ways. Well, I'm it? not actually a fan of these normally. Well, what it did for me is it, a lot of the gravel in my voice. Mm. It smooths it all out, sure. which is which is an interesting thing for me to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's do some fun things. Let's go back to the 251. And I'm going to show you this kind of cool control we added called Intensity. Now, what Intensity does is it takes all of the stuff that we modeled, like all the you know you know the harmonics and the saturation and the frequencies response and all that stuff, and we it amplifies it. Cool. So it kind of gives you a more colorful version of the microphone. You know, it's just something we we decided would be a cool feature. So let's bring it to let's say uh, one hundred and twenty six percent and take a listen to this again. You scream like an animal. It's incredible how you feel. More colorful. It's it yeah. kind of brought out even more of the mids. It almost kind of morphed it into a little bit more of that 47-inch mid-range. I was about to say, kind of yeah. had some 47-ish to Yeah, yeah. Which kinda, is probably why I liked it. Yeah, yeah I, I thought that was really cool. Now, now let's do something just for fun. Again, what the virtual drive does in the preamp modules is it simulates increasing the input gain while automatically decreasing the output trim. That's great. So, uh, let's play with the kind of, you know that distorted vocal effect that you hear in a lot of records? Well, sure. so many times guys are getting that effect by just slamming the input of a 73 uh, mic pre, so we can do that effect right now. Great. So let's just crank it all the way, and then we'll go to um, uh, master here, and we'll put a trim just to really just give it a lot of juice. Great. And uh, we'll put the output trim down a little bit too. Here we go. You scream like an animal It's incredible how you feel <laughs> That's just a cool effect that, you know, you can have a lot of fun with. Obviously this preamp, uh, would, you know, sounds good on a lot of things you want to distort. Like for instance, uh, a lot of times I'll put it on a, a bass malt. And I'll distort the bass and crank a bunch of mid-range from one of the EQs and then just lightly mix that in mix with the dry in. bass to get a lot of bite and, 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 you know, some growl from the bass tracks. That's a kind of a cool effect. I mean, this is great because, I, I mean, I do these kind of things with Sansamp, obviously, which comes free with good old Pro Tools. Sure, yeah. But to be able to have simulations of incredible pieces of equipment that you can do, do this with is, that's a whole step above. Cool. It's fantastic, mate. So, um... What can you tell us about the mic? Now you made this incredibly flat. Yeah, so the, the point of this microphone was we needed a reference point that was higher bandwidth mm -hmm. than the things that we were modeling. Right. Because if you start with more data, then you can model things with less, less data. Sure. You can't do the opposite, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah, it's the ML1 microphone. It's incredibly flat, incredibly Wonderful. linear. 
uh, if you listen to it, it, you know, it doesn't sound boring, but it just sounds like, you know, it's not your typical hyped microphone. It doesn't have that hype mid-range right. or lows or highs. Very, very flat, very, very clear, and the perfect starting point to do our models. And okay. then if you go here, if you're right behind you, then it goes Listen to me. the VMS-1 Ultra Linear Mic Preamp. This thing was created to be the flattest preamp possible. Uh, Paul Wolf helped in the design, of course, Paul Wolf again from formerly of API, Tonelux, and now Fix Audio. And it just uses, you know, the newest technology amplifiers to create an incredibly high bandwidth, flat, and linear signal. So when it finally gets to the workstation, we have this really beautiful blank canvas that we can apply the algorithms. Now, whether you've got an input instrument and mic, so you can use this pre... Oh, yeah, it's great. I can plug a bass guitar in here, then load oh, up the, the, like the, the 76 preamp module and get a beautiful, thick, warm, rich uh, bass DI sound. And this is all included in the price? Absolutely. So you get a, a decent, great mic pre as well that you can also plug in. Yeah, well, it's more than decent. It's it's the real deal. You get an amazing mic pre. There that you, you go. can plug Here, a guitar watch, into. Feel as well. that knob. I mean, you know, it's all metal knob, high quality stuff. Yeah, that's great. Feels good, right? Beautiful. Very nice indeed. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Warren. Now this is a wonderful product. Um, I don't say that very often, but I really believe that this is uh, something that's a great leveler, and uh, it's going to give a lot of people a lot of access to some amazing sounds. Now, Stephen has created audio samples on the original mics and also the simulations that you can hear, and they will be available below, available below with all the full links and everything, so you'll be able to hear for yourself what they do. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and uh, as ever, leave loads of comments and questions below. We love the discussion. If there's anything specific, I may even text him and ask him directly. So. And I will answer those texts. Oh, there you go. Except not, no more 4 a.m. ones, man. Really. Come on. Just e easy on Don't us. tell my wife about that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks ever so much for watching. Have a marvelous time recording and uh, speak to you soon.